we we know that heaven is a body dependent phenomenon you know hell too is a body dependent phenomenon you have to have the sense of uh the need to be tortured or have the mm -hmm. paradigm that uh insists you be tortured jeff kober it is an honor it's a pleasure to have you on my podcast thank you so much for making the time thanks for having me it's uh, always good to see you absolutely um i guess one one disclaimer that we should make is that we know each other fairly well <laughs> we've been we've been in the same in fact i was reading some of your um some of your through some of your uh, articles and stuff that have been written about you. And I didn't realize you learned Vedic meditation when you were 48. Is that, is that accurate? I did. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. I've written that I knew pretty much right away when I met Tom within like 10 minutes, I knew that I wanted to be a meditation teacher. At what point did you have that realization? I didn't. Um, you know, I here's my experience was I, I had spent so long in the darkness that I would I would meditate, I would go and listen to Tom and I go, like, oh God, this is all the truth. And I would write it all down. I would take notes of all the truths that I was hearing. And then and I would leave the room and forget everything. And I would mm -hmm. be back in, you know, despair. Oh God. So I'd have to go back and listen again. And, you know, I'm from Montana. I'm, uh, if I'm there, I start helping out. So I would start, you know, setting up chairs, take, you know, I just got an email from Tom Knowles. Isn't that something? Um, uh, you know, I'm setting up chairs, taking down chairs, helping people, talking to them, you know, telling them my experience. And then, uh, and then eventually I started doing the puja ceremony with Tom and, and, um, you know, hanging out and having breakfast afterwards. And then, uh, and at a certain point, he said, um, so I'm going to be, uh, this was uh, 2007, 2006, he said, you know, I'm going to be teaching another group of uh, people to become teachers. And uh, you need to become a teacher. I said, I don't want to be a teacher. And he said, well, you know, he said, well, you, you know enough now that you're already being a teacher. The only question is, will you be an informed teacher or an uninformed teacher? I said, look, man, I'm an actor. You're the guru. Get me, get me a pilot. And he said, you can do both. Uh, okay. And, you know, and then I signed up to, you know, go to India and, and then be in uh, Flagstaff and have that, uh, that experience we had becoming teachers. And I don't know if you know this, but about a week before, uh, about two weeks before we graduated, I, I said to Tom, I said, so when do I start planning what I'm going to do when I get out of here? He says, don't. I said, oh, yeah, okay, that's fine. But when do I start planning what I'm going to do when I get out of here? He said, just let it play itself out. I said, oh, God, okay. And about a week before we were done, um, I called my sister in Montana and she burst into tears on the phone. I said, and she told me what was going on. I said, Oh, you need to learn to meditate. I'm, I'm coming up to teach you. And she said, yeah, right. I said, no, no, I am. And I called Adele said road trip. And I set up two intro talks, one in Western Montana, where my sister was and one in Eastern Montana, where I came from, I called a friend and said, you know, tell me about a yoga studio there. And I made an appointment to, to go give an intro talk. And on the day I gave my first intro talk, I got a call from my manager offering me a Western that was going to start shooting the day after I would finish the second group of people. So it was like the universe saying, yes, you can do both of these things. And and, and that's, you know, been my experience since they rarely interfere with each other and I'm able to do them both. Mm. Um, when did you first start the daily email, the Vedic meditation or is it Vedic thoughts of the day? <clears throat> I think it was I remember 2011. That being... Okay. So you've and, been teaching and, for a few uh, years then at that point. Yeah, we, we started in, uh, we graduated in July of uh, 2007. And so I've been teaching for, you know, 
this was this was the beginning of the year 2011 Adele is a poet and she had decided to write a poem a day for a year and after she'd done it for a couple of weeks I thought well I should do something for a year or two and so I you know I I had like 25 people on a mailing list and I just sent them a little thought saying you know and just you know it's that idea of the trim tabs on a on a ship you just turn it a little bit and it changes the course of the of the ocean liner you know it's and it's you know meditation makes us ready to change but then what am i going to change to you know i need to put in something other than what my general thinking is and so that's what i started sending out it was just something you know, like think about this instead of what an awful person you are or what an awful people they are or you know what a, what, a, what a terrible childhood i had yeah think about think about this concept and you know so i started sending that out on a daily basis was that your first one the trim tab you know? no no i don't know i don't know what my first one was i <laughs> uh, i should look that up shouldn't i <laughs> Well, you inspired me to do the same thing five years later. And I, I remember my first one was about green tea, which is just something I've been thinking about that day and was passionate about it and tried to make some kind of spiritual lesson out of the history of green, green tea. <laughs> but that's um, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, it's called Make Tea, Not War. Um, but anyway, so you did you think you were just going to do it for a year? Is that, was that the original yeah. sort of idea? That was the plan. Yeah, I was going to do it for a year. And then, and then I got close to a year and I said, okay, so th this has been a great experiment. Thanks for playing. And, and you know, people wrote, uh, maybe two people wrote and said, no, keep doing it. And, uh, you know, and I just, oh, okay. And, you know, the truth is, you know, who benefited the most from it is me. <laughs> right. The teacher is the most interested student in the room. No kidding. Yeah. And, and you're always teaching something you need to know. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, and I let myself just be guided by what I was listening to or reading on a daily basis. And you, you don't change your experience of life magically. You do it a little bit at a time and you train yourself to see things through a different lens. You know, so that's what I was doing by because the the one challenge I set for myself was that if someone waded through what because I used to be quite wordy, um, if mm -hmm. someone waded through everything I, I wrote, they would feel better at the end than they had at the beginning. That was mm -hmm. that was it. They would feel just mm -hmm. this much more uplifted. I've been saying that, too, with my own work is. If you know your purpose, if you know your intention, that's the, your best editor, right? Because where, when you have your line, it's so clever and you want to put it in there, but it doesn't really support that purpose or intention, then you kind of have to take it out. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that freedom, though, when you learn? They call it killing your babies. Killing your babies, you know, yeah. Like your mm -hmm. favorite line, yeah. Mm -hmm. when you when you find the freedom to edit yourself mm -hmm. that's that was one of the great uh joys of putting this book together was just you know finding these places where i had gone to great lengths to grammatically uh correctly express something and then saying uh see even that sentence right there was just way too much um it, to just slash it down and leave a dangling participle and say it more simply it was, mm -hmm. it was just, oh, it was such a relief. So talk a little bit about your process that developed over time, because I'm sure some people listening to this may, may be thinking of doing something similar, the daily something or offering. What was, how did your process evolve from the early days to, you've been doing this for 11 years now then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, uh, you know, it be began with, almost always, not always, but almost always taking uh, inspiration from someone else's work, you know, listening, you know, listening to someone, uh, David Hawkins uh, lecture, or, you know, reading something from Deepak Chopra. And, uh, you know, so that 
I wasn't presenting myself as an expert. It's like, here's what an expert says, and here's what I take from it. And uh, I, I saw myself as being the, uh, you know, I'll go out and forage for the juicy little tidbits, and then I'll bring back a tidbit and then talk about or write about how this little piece of, of truth affected me or how it reflects something that uh, is true with me. Um, and then at the end, I would I would write a uh, uh, I began to write uh, uh, the setting of an intention for the day. Um, you know, one of the real guiding principles for me was the the work of Sri Aurobindo, who said uh, that uh, all life is yoga, and uh, that was one of the, he was really a, a huge teacher for me before I learned this meditation, um, and. Uh, all life is yoga, meaning everything we do is an opportunity to identify as spirit and to find a way to connect with a greater experience of spirit than what is what we, what we can know in our small self. Um, and so setting an intention, setting a spiritual intention then allows me on a daily basis to move in the direction of this higher good, move in the direction of this yoga, this union with something greater. And so I would offer that as a, you know, you might want to set an intention like this. And, uh, you know, and, and I labored over these. There were times when, it, you know, I would, I would write for two hours in a night to get it right and to you know have Adele read it and she would edit me and it would piss me off and then I would rewrite it and, and uh you know just finding a way of you know finding my voice finding my way through this um and ignoring the fact that someone was going to be reading it and judging it mm -hmm. just you know letting it and so then looking for that place of humility to know that it's not my business how anyone reacts it is my business to make sure that it is as free of my personal uh shortcomings as possible as free of of my uh personality needs as possible that it's uh as much as i can you know just like with acting this is as true as i can get at this moment mm -hmm. you know and uh i think you know the the evolution of it was uh I taught myself how to be a better writer. I taught myself how to say more with fewer words. I taught myself how to allow flow to occur uh, more and more within myself. Um, and, uh, it, you know, as it evolved over the years, it was just more and more about, uh, you know, spiritual work is really so very simple, not easy at all, but it's, you know, it's, it's really simple when you have a paradigm that you can uh, resonate with, when you can, that you can relate to, like the Vedic worldview is, it's so simple. It's just, spirit is all that there is. Consciousness is all that there is. And uh, my head tells me constantly, I'm separate from that you know, and you put the one up against the other. And, and, uh, you know, the one that says, consciousness is all that there is, and we're meant to enjoy our lives, can always win out over the negativity of I'm limited, I don't belong, I don't deserve. And, you know, spiritual work is constantly reminding ourselves of the one truth and letting go of our, our perseveration on the other truth. And so that's what I try to write from. And, and along with acting, you know, it's, if I'm not writing from that place of freedom, I can't possibly be speaking in any worthwhile way about freedom. You know, so it was a, a way of teaching myself freedom. Can you share the story of Peter and Christy just to give the listener an idea of, of how these um, daily thoughts kind of shaped up in a real world way? And then obviously you included that one in the book but it kind of gives you an, an, an idea of what they are like. So uh, I'd been meditating for, uh, I don't know, maybe two, three, four years at this time. Um, and I had some writing I needed to do. I wasn't 
doing this uh, daily thought at that time, but I was uh, uh, writing something. Um, <clears throat> and I, I had my son uh, who was uh, I think 15 at the time, 14 or 15, he was going to a birthday party in Hancock Park. And so I thought I can drop him off leave in there for two hours, I can go to this coffee shop, I can get my writing done. This is fantastic. It was a Sunday afternoon. And I dropped him off, went to this coffee shop on uh, Larchmont Boulevard. Got the last table available, got my cappuccino, got my pen and my paper out. And before my pen hit the paper, I heard my name, Jeff, how are you? And I looked up and it was this guy, Peter, whom I'd known for, you know, 20 years at that point but just a little bit, he was, our paths crossed, uh, you know, we had a lot of friends in common and, uh, you know, I, we'd wave and say hi and chat for a moment, but I didn't really know him, but he was there with, with his wife and he seemed really happy to see me. Um, and they were getting coffee and, and there was no place to sit. So I said, uh, would you like to join me? There's no table available. And I, I was inside saying, please say no, please say no, I want to do my writing. And they said, Oh, God, we would love to. And so they got their coffee and sat down. And I'd already learned enough at that point to just, you know, not fight for my right to write, uh, you know, just to set that aside. And they started telling me, uh, they were telling me that this was their weekend together, their son was away at brass camp, 12 year old boy, and they had spent the week acting as if they were on vacation in Los Angeles. And this was their last afternoon together. And they were having the Larchmont experience. And, and then they started telling me the story of their, of their, their life together. They'd been together for 20 years. They, uh, you know, they had lots of adventures together and separately. He was a film director. She worked in the music business. They were, you know, very successful and, uh, just both lovely people and they just kept telling me the story of their of their life and their love affair and every once in a while they would say listen to what we're talking about jeff doesn't want to hear about this let's talk about something else and then they would slide right back into telling me the story of themselves together and eventually uh you know after about an hour christy got up to use the facilities and i just said to Peter, oh, she's just lovely, and uh, I'm so happy to meet her. And he said, "Yeah, she is, isn't she?" And I said, "You know, I'm sitting here watching the two of you fall in love mm. all over again." He said, "Really, you're seeing that because I feel that." And I said, "Yeah, it's clear." Christy came back to the table, and he told her what I had said, and and uh, and we just had this extraordinary just a beautiful bonding moment. The three of us, we, we were really having an experience together, and we all knew it. It was just one of those rare moments where all the guards are down, where you know that love is the only thing that's happening and you're willing and able to uh, engage in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was having a group of people I wanted uh, Peter to talk to, uh, we, a, a weekly group gathering, and, and he was going to come and talk on, on Wednesday. So I, we exchanged information and uh, uh, I sent him an email that night telling him the uh, particulars of the uh, of the gathering and, and I didn't hear back from him the next day. And so on Tuesday morning, I called and Christy got on the phone and, and, you know, I called for Peter and, and she got on the phone and said, is this Jeff? I said, yeah. And she said, Jeff from Sunday. I said, yeah. And she said, well, we had that experience together on Sunday. And, and on Monday he walked, went out to walk the dog and he died. And I said, what? She said, he just, he just dropped dead nine o'clock yesterday morning. And, um, and we sat and talked for like 45 minutes, an hour, just about the experience we had had together and about her husband who is now gone. And she asked me to speak at his, at his memorial service. And so, you, you know, uh, that following Saturday, there was a memorial service at Forest Lawn, and I went, I wasn't a public speaker at the time, I wasn't a teacher, but I got up and told the story of their last day together. Mm. And it became so clear that they needed to have that experience together in order for him to move on, and in order for her to be able to go on. They needed to have a, uh, a, a 
they needed to underline the truth of what they had together. And what they needed in order for that to happen was a witness, someone mm -hmm. to accurately and clearly reflect back to them. This is what I'm seeing so that what you're feeling is real. What you're feeling about this, this uh, solidifying of this, this underlining of the truth of what you have together. That's real because I can feel it over here. And it, it's, it, it allowed me to take the, the place of an angel. I wasn't being angelic, but an angel is in that sense was someone who takes in the light from somebody amplifies it or reflects it back accurately and clearly so that that light comes back on oneself and and uh enlivens that truth within that self and you know and i i honestly believe that you know peter needed that to give himself permission to leave because we all i think we all know everything all the time and the way it works clearly is that nature gave me the idea that I needed to write something. It just, you know, it's, it's sort of like the, the announcement goes out, uh, clean up on aisle 10, you know, and who's available. That's, I'm, I'm, I have something and, oh, you go, you need to write something. You go and, and then you're aware enough of the, of where you are and what you're doing to let go of your initial need to take on the need of the time, which was they needed someone to sit there with them and, and, uh, you know, help them with that experience. And my God, it was so powerful for me. And what required on my part was the willingness to sit and listen, the willingness to let go of my own felt need. And, and what the, the result of that was for all parties was so much more powerful even for me, it, it felt so fantastic to be given that gift of, of being that guy in that moment. So it also ties into what Tom, the business advice Tom gave you, which is establish yourself in being through your practice and then just just let things, you know, happen as they're happening around you and just kind of go with what feels like the thing you should be doing. Because I think anybody yeah. can listen to that and, 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 um, and and take use that as a takeaway for their for your life literally today you know and 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 that first part establishing yourself and being you know make sure you're being consistent with your practices that are that's allowing you to kind of get out of the carnival as you say and into your heart and then the heart will guide you exactly where you need yeah. to be yeah yeah and 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 along with that to uh have the willingness to let go of accomplishing the goal mm -hmm. that gets you moving in a direction it's the direction that matters it's not the fulfillment that matters mm -hmm. because if i had been stuck on fulfilling the desire that arose in me i would have missed the desire that nature had for me mm -hmm. i would have said god i'd love for you to join me but i have all this work to do go away and i would have missed out <laughs> on this extraordinary experience so you have 108 of these beautiful little gems of these anecdotes, these vignettes, um, these aphorisms, and you've curated them from 11 years of daily writing, which is how many, what does that come down to? Like how many thousands of- That's, of... that's many, but I, 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 <laughs> I recycle. Um, so I, I probably have 700, 750, you know, uh, different essays that I've written. Yeah, but why well, hundred and look up the one from Mexico City and yeah, oh, because three sixty five felt like way too many, um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> way too much work, and and because you know one hundred eight is uh, uh, is the is the power number in uh, uh, Vedic uh, teachings, it's the. Um, it's the it's the number of completion it's the number uh one stands for uh the oneness of consciousness zero stands for uh uh whole wholeness and eight stands for infinity the uh you know and mm. um all these different if you look up 108 online you can see all these different uh ratios of the universe that are 
expressed by that figure of 108 or 1008. Um, mm -hmm. So it just, it seemed like, that seemed like a chunk that I could actually digest and, and put out uh, as a book. And it gives me an opportunity to start working on volume two. So there's that. I love it. So um, Embracing Bliss is, is the name of the book. And, uh, and you, you, you are the primary inspiration behind, uh, behind this book, which is Knowing Where to Look, 108 Daily Doses of Inspiration, which is taken from my, my five years of daily writing that I uh, was inspired to do from, from your oh, thoughts wow. of the day. So, so you can take responsibility for both your book as well as this book and, <laughs> and Jackie's book. Yeah. Embracing Bliss. I love it. Embracing it's great, bliss. man. I'm really, uh, I'm really honored to call you a colleague and a friend. Um, my last question that I'd like to wrap these conversations up with is um, how are you looking at success these days? You, you've been an accomplished actor. You've written a book now. You've taught many, many, probably thousands of people meditation. How does Jeff Kober see his his see success in the lens of his experience? <clears throat> well, success is. I'll tell you what. It's not. It's no longer. If I get this, I'll be okay. If mm -hmm. I just accomplish that, I'll be okay. What it is for me is, um, you know, the, the, the truth that, that we both know is that success actually means successive change, moving in the direction of ever more fully present, ever more fully able to follow something other than my best thinking my intellect and my plan and design for what I'm supposed to be doing. So for me, success is always finding the willingness or crawling back <laughs> to finding the willingness to be fully alive and to be free and to, uh, uh, to insist on knowing myself as uh, having something still to do here something still to accomplish, something still to express. Because if I'm still in a body, that means there's something still viable in this equation. And I'm meant to be doing something in my job. And it that something has to do with uplifting. And it has to do with knowing that I, uh, I belong here. And knowing the worthiness of all life, even through myself. And uh, success on a daily basis is finding a way to insist on that and stepping into that, whatever it means on a daily basis. And, and for me to be able to accomplish that, I have to have different outlets. There's writing, there's teaching, there's uh, acting, there's photography. I do tend to have photography and uh, there's always something to be done in one of those areas. Um, and, uh, and, I always try to do it from a sense of adventure rather than a sense of uh, duty and obligation. And that's uh, uh, allowing myself to be pulled forward by the need of spirit or consciousness rather than to be pushed forward by my need to get out of discomfort. Is, uh, that's, uh, I guess that's the way I can say it. Um, I don't know what... I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, uh, but I get to discover it on a daily basis. How do you know when it's time to stop writing these daily emails? I don't know. Um, I, now You'll let me know. <laughs> <laughs> when I figure it out. I, I have the same know, question, man. to be you honest know, with you, man. I'm like, I, I am I going to do this forever? Like, is this just a forever thing? Or what, what, how does this end? What, I don't know. What's the exit it's strategy weird, on, right? this, on this thing I painted myself I, in this corner I, I painted myself into? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a responsibility. But, you know, it's, 
people are still benefiting from it. How can you just stop if it's if it takes so little effort to do it? You know, I guess I, I guess the answer is when I get so busy that I can no longer do it, I, I I'll I'll give myself an exit. Well, I like what you said earlier. You said it 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 influences the way you see things in your life. Have, knowing that you're writing this thing every day when you're having a conversation, it's not just a conversation anymore. It could it could potentially be a Peter and Christy type of experience. So you need to pay attention to everything that's happening and really show up and be present. And that's what my experience has been. It's allowed me to be a lot more present in those in-between, um, otherwise throwaway moments that most people just kind of dismiss as, oh, that wasn't that important. But actually, there is a lot in there in every moment. Because you know you're you're. We actually you're... call it that. May, that's so well said. Yeah, absolutely. We actually call it killing time. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? I'm just wasting time. Why would you do that? Because you would miss out on the. the you know, it's. I, I've just I've done some study recently. I haven't done it, but I've uh, looked into uh, you know hallucinogenic. Uh, drugs used to to for spiritual advancement <clears throat> you know when they were first able to do uh uh the mris in real time with people taking psilocybin and different uh, psychotropic drugs they expected to see the brain turn on and light up in ways that it hadn't but what they actually found was that it was shutting down the default mode network Mm -hmm. which is the thing that causes us to have a sameness of experience and it's it's survival we don't need to know what's the same in this situation because it, it hasn't killed us and it won't kill us this time but something new and different that i need to pay attention to mm -hmm. when the default mode network shuts down it's not that we're seeing things that aren't there we're seeing what is there and what is there is it's a bloody adventure to be alive in every moment there is a, 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 a fantastic world of, of life occurring when we allow ourselves to take it in. And I'm not saying, you know, drop acid and, and, and go about your business. I'm saying you don't need acid. If you just get present and really allow your senses to take in what's happening, it's mm -hmm. far more uh, interesting and adventurous than anything you can find in your intellect. You know, so th that's what that's what you're saying, I think, is that, you know, get here because it's a great place to be. Also, I think the power of the commitment, the daily deadline, you know, it's it's it, that's that's a great intention when you have time. But if you know you have to send something out every day, you really it forces you to have to show up, even if you don't want to show up, if, you, if you're too busy to show up or if you're too sick to show up or if you're too whatever to show up, you still yeah. have to show up. You still have to yeah. show up. And it's 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 doable. I I would never think that that was doable, but but also it's it's much like meditation, isn't it? Because mm. when you show up to the meditation twice a day, you're you find that the benefit is so great that you're not really willing to give it up. Right. And you know if you're really again paying attention, you know, and uh, you can't really see how something like this daily writing benefits you but you can know that it's been a part of whatever has taken you from where you were to where you are and you know where i am is i i, I kind of dig it so I, I and i know that that writing has been a part of that that journey probably still is so i'll keep doing it at least for the moment you tell me if you figure out how to get out of it Have you had any sort of res resolution around that accident that happened when you were 15 and how, what that what that meaning is oh, and how that relates absolutely. to what you're doing now? You know, and I first got the hint of this uh, in working with a Jungian analyst years ago, and there was a, a, a theory of uh, like Jesus and Judas had made a deal with each other that um you know that this thing needed to be accomplished and you know judas uh jesus is the one that got to leave early and judas is the one who had to be reviled for at least two thousand years um 
for being the the betrayer of of Jesus. And I really have come to see it as an agreement that two souls made before they came into this world that uh, he needed seven years to accomplish what he needed to accomplish. And I needed to torture myself for several years to accomplish what I needed to, to accomplish. And, uh, you know, we made an agreement to do that. And, and the fact is that there was only one kid. I, I was on a, you know, we were, I met uh, this boy on a school bus and protected him from some bullies. I never protected kids from bullies and I never befriended a kid other than this kid. Mm. And, you know, and, and we knew each other for some time before, before that accident occurred. And he wasn't in a place where I would have imagined him to be. I, I, you know, it was like all these things point to uh, an organizing principle beyond what I can comprehend. And it has helped me to develop my theory of life and consciousness that before we come in, it's like we we have a talk with our committee and and say so okay i want to i want to learn these lessons this time and and they go you know that's that's going to be a really big lesson that's going to suck for a long time i said yeah i know but i've i've just kind of screwed around the last few lives i want to have a i really want to take a big chunk of of uh growth this time and and they say okay and then you find your 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 family and you go oh they just they they just made a baby okay i'm going in and you dive in and then you forget you know you you forget where you came from you forget why you're here and you have the task of remembering mm -hmm. of going through this and and finding your way once again back to uh the freedom of life and the joy of existence and uh and letting go of as much as possible you, you can again and again and again uh the weight that that being a human puts on you and if i hadn't had that big a challenge i never would have done the kind of spiritual work i've had to do you know i it's, <laughs> it's why would you if you're having a you know i i taught a a guy who's the head of a big corporation um to meditate and i said you know you've you actually have a bigger challenge than most people because your life works, man. You know, he's like got so much money and, you know, uh, potential mates throwing themselves at him and, and the ability to buy anything he wants and, and he's healthy and, and happy. And why should he work so hard to, to learn that he is spirit? The life really working out for him. It was the opposite for me. I had to find a spiritual answer. I'm 48 right now. And I, when I think about you, <laughs> when I first met you, I felt like you were like, you looked older than, than I look right now. <laughs> like I always saw you as like this really mature, this worldly, this guy's been around. I, I don't see myself that way, ironically, you know, but I think that's kind of how it is. Everything from the inside looks <laughs> different yeah. than from the outside. Yeah. yeah. And how old would our teacher have been around that time? Well, there's two different stories uh, about that, but I think he was, I, I think he was born in '48, so that would make have made him fifty. You'd be seventy-three. How old he have been? Seventy-three now. He would have been fifty-three at that time. That was twenty okay. years ago. Gosh, that's crazy. So he would have been five years older than I am right now. Yeah. Wow. It's so crazy the subjectivity of time hmm. and and what we choose to make of it is mm -hmm. kind of fascinating isn't it mm -hmm. they have a whole I thing guess... about that on uh, uh there's a i read for a show and i had to watch a, an episode of it to see what the tone was it's called reservation dogs mm -hmm. taiki waititi is one of the executive producers of it and it's about uh, Native Americans in Oklahoma, and it's it's so funny. But last night uh, we watched an episode, and they were talking about string theory and the uh, the paradox that time uh, 
should move in all directions uh, instead of just forward. Uh, so it's 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 a comedy. About, mm -hmm. uh, that that story goes nowhere. That's it. They were just they were talking <laughs> about time. Well, no. Speaking about speaking of reservations and time, let's take it back to Billings, Montana, because you grew up. That's near a reservation, right? It's kind of like sandwiched in between a reservation and Yellowstone National Park. Well, Montana has more reservation land than any other state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what was that were, like growing up? Well, there were not a lot of. Uh, natives in, in there were none in my town but we played there were certain teams that we played and it was class c sports we played eight man football and 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 basketball and we were against teams that were uh completely indian off the reservation or uh half half indian you know mm -hmm. um, and uh i had one uh, good friend from edgar uh he was a crow uh, tommy Roundface. Um, and he, he ended up, uh, being given the choice of jail or the service. So he went into the Navy back then. Um, so it was, uh, you know, it was, it, it was what I noticed about it back then was that people need a group to look down on. And people looked down on uh, natives in wh where I grew up. You know, they were mm -hmm. able to demonize them uh, because of uh, what it looked like from the outside. You know, um, because was that happening in your own household, or was that was your house different? <clears throat> it wasn't. My my house was not uh, openly uh, racist, um, but uh, you know push comes to shove i'm i'm sure that 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 uh, those you know words to that effect would have been spoken i imagine mm -hmm. you know you yeah but you don't know the indians um you know just w some group that's other mm -hmm. yeah that's that's and it's like what what's going on right now you know in eastern europe is everyone is there's such a i think people have a, a feel a sense of relief that they can you know hate someone outside the country you know putin it's all putin's fault no it's not it's mm -hmm. capitalism's fault it's you know it's the fault of of the ego it's the fault of being a human and you know putin is the face of that right now but yeah so what was the vibe like growing up in billings in your house and your family and and stuff who was around what were they talking about what were some of the ideologies that were, well, you were was, being indoctrinated I was raised in a, a German Lutheran home. Uh, mm -hmm. My father and two of his brothers uh, worked the, the family farm. Um, his parents uh, both emigrated from uh, Germany or uh, German settlements in Russia at the toward the turn of the century, the turn of the you know nineteenth to twentieth century, and. Uh, it was just, it was really hard work. And uh, Lutheranism was basically, uh, you're not meant to enjoy your life, you're meant to suffer. And mm -hmm. if you believe in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, and don't screw it up right at the end, then you'll go to heaven. Um, and, you know, children should be seen and not heard. Uh, there was a there was actually a you know uh, the drama of the gifted child uh, uh was a book that was came into favor in the late i guess it was the late 70s um and in that book uh they quoted a uh a, a lutheran german child rearing manual from the 18th century that said the will of the child must be broken by the time they're 3 so that they can be built up properly from there you know, and it was a lot of that. Just you, you didn't have any agency. You weren't given a, you know, you, you weren't, you were let run wild. I just ran wherever I wanted in the, on the farm, but uh, there was no, no one was reflected by their parents the way that, you know, a child needs to be reflected by their parents. I was trying to get, I remember being six years old and 
sitting down next to this stream and looking back up the hill at the house and thinking, I'm six, I can't leave here till I'm 18. That's three times longer than I've been here already. Oh my God, I, I don't know how I'm gonna make it. <laughs> you had that realization when you were just six years when old. When I was six years old, yeah. <laughs> I started early. Were you basically like a farm hand, like as you were growing up, were you working a lot and all that hard work? Were you, was that your experience? Well, yes. Yes. And no. Yeah. I, <clears throat> we worked, you know, we worked 10 hour days, 12 hour days. Um, mm -hmm. I, I stacked a lot of hay for a dollar an hour. Um, I, you know, <laughs> and when I wasn't working for my family farm, I was working on someone else's farm and it was, backbreaking work it was horrifying man farmers work way too hard for for what the payoff is and uh you know and then and they work hard and then a lot of them or at least some of them you know uh when the work is over uh when harvest happens then it's time to drink you know my my father would go away for uh weekends he would he would go bowling on a Thursday night and sometimes come home <laughs> on Friday and sometimes on Saturday and sometimes on Monday. Mm. You know. What was your aspiration as you were like in your teenage years? I don't know that I had one light. You know, I you was, definitely didn't want to do that, right? You didn't I see didn't, your a life of I didn't want to do that. And the other options were uh in the the next town over. You know, we were in a really small town. Yeah, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I had you know, 70 people in my high school. Um, the, the other options were the railroad or the oil refinery. And I, I didn't, I, you know, I thought about being a pilot. I wanted to be a pilot. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a Superman or Jesus. Those were my choices. Um, because one was invulnerable and the other one didn't care uh, if he was hurt or not. Um, and, uh, you know, I needed something magic. I needed something bigger than, than what we could, uh, what I had access to, to knowing one could do. And then when I was 15, I had this accident and that derailed everything, everything that was there, uh, anything that was there, um, you know, just, I would no longer deserve to have a life. I no longer deserved happiness. I, don't, I no longer deserve to want anything. What was the accident? I was uh, uh, I was involved in a, 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 a little boy ran out in front of my car um, on Halloween night, the night before our, uh, I was a football player and it was the night before our uh, championship game. Um, and uh, he was killed, he was a friend of mine. Um, and, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't breaking the law, but I had killed someone and then, because of the place where we lived, no one talked to me. The, the Germans are like, they don't talk. No one mm -hmm. ever talked to me about the accident. Uh, and no one ever, I, I never spoke to a, uh, a guidance counselor as to what I wanted to do with my life. I never spoke to anyone about anything. You, you keep everything inside <clears throat> and you're supposed to know how to do things without being shown how to do them. And you're berated for not knowing how to do them. And and then that happened and you know then i was just uh you know i wanted to die i couldn't die i tried a few times um and uh i wasn't able to to go through with it um so then i just uh you know then i went down my own path of uh you know just medicating myself as much as possible smoking a lot of cigarettes drinking when i could you know smoking pot uh, just being kind of a, a bum for several years there. So what was your understanding of, is that where you sort of broke with Lutheranism and you had to develop your own sort of spiritual understanding of the world and how things work and that things are fated to be and destiny and randomness and all of that? Well, that was a long time coming at that point. It was you know, because when I was a little kid, I used to sit in the Lutheran church and, and there was a, this, there's this somewhat well-known painting uh, by a German of 
Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, praying, you know, before the, the, and in the background, the Roman soldiers are cutting off, uh, I think it's Peter's ear, somebody's, they mm -hmm. cut off someone's ear, and, and, uh, and I kept, I would stare at that painting and want the, to see the hair move, want to see some evidence of life, because I wanted to believe in the reality of, of the divine. And, and of course, I never saw anything like that. But when that accident happened, then I was, it was like I was over here and God was over there. And it was like I had made an agreement with God that if you stay over there, I'll stay over here and torture myself. And uh, so you don't have to worry about it. And I was no longer fit to go to God. I was no longer able to even try to have a connection with God. I had been, I had done something that uh, took me off the board. Um, so then I, I, I lived with an idea of God, but without God being in my life and without the possibility of God being in my life. And it was many years later that I began to study uh, spirituality, began to look for some kind of an answer. Um, but that was like, that was, I guess, 10, 12, maybe 15 years later, you know, after a long period of time, just being lost and wandering in the wilderness, as they, as they say. I mean, Billings, Billings is a small town, right? Something like that is very traumatic. I imagine you would have a bit of a scarlet letter type type of feeling as a young person walking around that town, is that one of the reasons why you went so far away to Los Angeles? Yeah, yeah, because I was, it was, you know, I was that guy. I was that kid. That was that, you know, there people whispering that was my story. Yeah. And, That's you know, and, yeah, yeah, all that. They changed, you know, they changed uh, Halloween in my hometown to, uh, they uh, uh, banned um, trick or treating. So they would, they mm. would, from that point forward, they had like, because uh, I was from a small town outside of Billings and they, you know, they would have parties for the kids in the civic center rather than have them go out trick-or-treating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you moved to LA in your 20s. Was the plan to be mm -hmm. an actor or you just wanted to get out of <laughs> Billings and I, 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 see what I, happens? I went... So I hitchhiked around. I was in a carnival. I uh, <laughs> I got arrested for uh, possession of marijuana. Um, I uh, and I finally realized that I needed to do something. So I uh, decided to go back to school. I had tried school right when I got out of high school, and it didn't work for me. But then I wanted to go back, and I went back to college and. Uh, just to try to do something with my life. Um, and I met a woman and she moved to LA and I followed her here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, I, I had no plan. I didn't, I didn't, I, you know, I, I didn't know, I didn't know how to make a plan. I didn't know how to find my way. I just, I, I enjoyed playing uh, music. I was a, a trombonist. So I practiced trombone a lot and uh, read a lot and, and, you know, uh, wrote some and then followed this woman. She was going to be an actress. Um, mm -hmm. That didn't work out for her, but uh, she left and I stayed. And then I, uh, I was in a rock band for a short period of time called The Walking Wounded. Um, mm -hmm. We, uh, I guess the, the high point of our, of our uh, band was uh, opening for Tim Harden. Um, he was, and then he was too drunk to hold his guitar. So we had to go back out and, and back him <clears throat> during his set. He kept dropping mm -hmm. his, he dropped, when he dropped his guitar for the third time, <laughs> get the, get the band back up here. Um, and I ended up working in an office, uh, as a temporary paralegal. And I remembered that life made sense when I was in a class and had an assignment and uh, I just mentioned to the, all these people I was working with that I was looking for a class and this woman said, I go to this acting class, I think you'd like it. Mm. And I went to the acting class and for the first time ever, you know, I was able to see what to do with all the feelings I had inside. 
It was like, not only was it okay to have feelings in this place, it was, uh, it was, it was celebrated. Mm. You know, and I was able to begin to have flow of life through me again, which had been shut down for a very long time. Mm. What what had you learned in your younger years growing up in small town USA that that you would you were able to then apply to that sort of Los Angeles acting? community that you found that helped you whether it was your resolve or you know you said it was backbreaking work but i'm sure a lot of times in those circles in la people see going to you know the post office is backbreaking work and you're like you, you guys have no idea what backbreaking work actually is did it affect your work ethic at all in any way yeah i think i had a, a really strong work ethic um mm -hmm. And I, I, I was willing to put myself through the ringer to, to do what I uh, needed to do to, you know, fulfill a certain role. Um, and there was something about, and I don't know if this was, I don't know if this is inherent, uh, if you come in with this, or if uh, it's something that you learn, but there was a, there was a sense of, Oh, there's another thing here, but there was a sense of, uh, I, I couldn't stand BS from myself. I couldn't stand to uh, 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 be anything other than truthful on stage. And that's, you know, that's like a superpower when it comes to acting. You know, if you have the willingness and ability to be seen, um, and to just let the truth of yourself flow. That's what, that's what acting is. And what I learned from my family system was I was the, uh, I was the go between, I was the mediator. And I had so many conversations with friends and with family of like, no, 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 what she really meant to say was, no, you don't, you're, 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 you're mistaken. You know, so uh, the ability to read people, mm -hmm. You know, when you don't have a, a strong grounding in yourself and you're at the mercy of those people, you learn how to read them really well. Mm. And, you know, and, and the nuance of uh, what mood is, go is going to come into the room this time. You know, who's, who, who are they going to be this time? Uh, uh, is, it, you know, is it okay for me to uh, have feelings or not? Is it okay for me to have an opinion or not? like that so that was, well that's that, the basis that was, of the meisner the meisner technique which you study right this idea of being your yeah. most authentic self and reading the room over whatever that's on written on the page it, it, reading the other person and right. allowing the other person's reality to draw out of you uh the uh the most uh powerful expression of your felt need like in every situation we have a, a an emotional need i i need you to love me i need you to respect me i, I need you to give me money um and uh and that's going to determine the way i speak to you that's going to determine the way i am with you and if i'm letting my performance be based on your reality rather than my own reality then i'm free and open and alive if I'm basing it on my reality, then I, I come up with ideas of how it should be. And it's not alive. It's just clunky. It's like, here's this moment. And here's this moment. Um, and that has served me well, just in terms of, uh, you know, building myself into a human that's capable of being with other humans, in that I think we all walk into a situation and are, you know, I, I look at things a lot in terms of we are spirit having a human experience and I'm always going to have a human animal need in a situation. I'm going to walk into a situation of strangers and my animal nature is going to want to defend or protect or, or dominate one of those animal things. And those needs of the animal nature rarely are useful in social situations. So then I get to, 
recognize that that's going to happen to me and then build in a stronger need, build in a more uh, uh, spiritually viable need, uh, a, a more uh, advanced need, which is, you know, in, in, in our work and in the work of spirit, it's almost always, if not always, to uplift, to, you know, to bring uh, joy or light to the equation, to be of service to the others in, the, in that equation. Uh, when you were in LA and you were in your earlier years, you know, working as the trombone player and the taxi driver and the handyman and dabbling in acting and getting better at that and all of that, did you have some sort of spiritual practices or any kind of foundation, any understanding that you pulled away from the Christianity? I tried some. Yeah, I got, uh, there was a, a group called the, I, I, I was introduced to a woman who'd who did the I Ching, um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I went to her, and uh, then she introduced me to some people, the Ananda Marga organization. They were some orange robes who had, um, you know, they ran orphanages around the world, and, and she convinced one of, one of the monks to teach me a meditation practice. It, it was, you know, and, and I always thought, you know, this is really going to help me as soon as I stop getting high. Um, <laughs> as, soon as, I, as soon as I put away the marijuana and the, and the alcohol and the amphetamines, this is really, I'm going to really have an experience here. Um, you know, and, and then I, uh, you know, and I read a lot. I I uh, I studied uh, the Tao, the Tao Te Ching. Um, I studied um, uh, science of mind. That was a big one. You know, Ernest Holmes and learning Holmes, how to yeah. do uh, scientific prayer and all that. Uh, yeah, so I was I was looking all the time, and I would go into used bookstores and just you know look for the truth, look for something that resonated with me. And there were, you know, there, there used to be this store in West Hollywood, the Bodhi Tree bookstore. And it was just, I would go in there and just look, you know, just wander around until a, a title would jump out at me. And one of the first books I read that was really powerful for me was uh, Das Energy by Paul Williams. You ever see that? Mm -hmm. It was like, it was published in the seventies and it was this little, book of uh you know short aphorisms um mm -hmm. that basically uh offered permission to have a good life and uh you know logically presented a case for uh the connectedness of humans to divinity and that something about that it was so simple and so not what I was used to, that it really resonated for me. And then another, um, I did some Feldenkrais work, uh, which is uh, Moshe Feldenkrais was a, uh, an Israeli who learned a new way of being in his body based somewhat on the Alexander technique. And he learned to train his body to overcome a, a terrible injury the, that he had had and people did this Feldenkrais work and it, it started to, I was so locked up. All the stresses in my system, all the trauma in my system has just locked me up. Uh, I was frozen and uh, the Feldenkrais work and uh, Alexander Lowen's uh, work. He was another guy who talked about f the physical approach to releasing trauma. Those mm -hmm. things started to free me up a little bit. Um, you know, and uh, it was just, it was, a, 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 but the, those were the beginnings. Mm -hmm. So let's juxtapose that with your, your acting career. You get China Beach, which is your first major role, right? How, how does that? Actually, I had the first major role I had was, uh, uh, I did a, a movie called Out of Bounds with Anthony Michael Hall. Mm -hmm. um, and I was the, you know, I was the the main bad guy. I was the third lead in that. And then uh, China Beach happened a couple of years later. Okay. Yeah. So as that as as that was all happening, how did you feel? You know, because there's this idea that as soon as I achieve the goal of doing what I'm here to do, that I'm going to be happy. <laughs> what was your experience? When with I that? 
Well, this is when I got this job uh, in in the movie. Um, here's here's what actually happened. I was so it was such a junkyard inside here that I was I gave my final audition to the mm -hmm. writer and director and producer. Uh, Richard Tuggle was the the writer and the the director. Um, uh, he was the director. Um, and uh tony somebody who was the writer i'm so sorry tony if you're listening to this um but i did the audition and then i said so then they were chatting and i said so do i have the job or not and i literally closed my eyes and went inside my head to watch the change happen you know if they were going to say yes i was going to see you know like ta-da some kind of light go on inside like you've made it you're 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 worth something and the opposite happened. Nothing changed. Nothing changed inside at all. And the uh, the hope of something being able to change what was inside me was now gone because I'd gotten mm -hmm. the thing that was supposed to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I could no longer uh, I could no longer escape the you know drugs and alcohol stopped working for me completely. I could no longer get a click. There was no switch that went off when I got enough. Uh, chemistry in my system mm -hmm. so that was the beginning of me you know letting go of drugs and alcohol too uh it was a really big change and i was terrified my whole first job it was 10 week shoot i was terrified through the whole thing that they were going to fire me after five weeks i figured well they have so much in the can now they can't fire me they can't afford it but i was terrified it was just horrifying to you know because if you're not willing to look at yourself or not able to look at yourself, and then you're exposing that self to others, especially if it's being, you know, uh, filmed. Uh, it's, you know, that's, that's terror. And you're, you're, you know, you're stepping into the unknown. That's the only way to act is to step into the unknown. It's really the only way to live too, because it's all unknown. I don't know what's going to happen in the next moment here. You've done a lot of podcasts, but you've never done this one with me. We've had a lot of conversations, but we've never had this one. <laughs> you know, so it's it was really a a huge lesson in uh, it doesn't matter if you're terrified as long as you keep showing up and doing your best and and speaking the truth and trying to be of service. That's what I was doing, and uh, it worked. Did you have a classic sort of rock bottom moment where you dropped the guitar three times or did you kind of just before you hit that point, you say, you know, I got to clean myself up here. No, I had that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was a, it was an odd little moment. Um, I I was a uh, I was a recreational crack user um, and. Uh, crack and scotch or crack and tequila, depending on my mood. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, you know, and I had gone out to celebrate this job, actually. And I had, and I was celebrating by it was my, it was my, my farewell to being a taxi driver. I was a taxi driver in LA. And this, uh, someone got in my car and said, um, had me go to this crack house down on I can't believe I'm telling you all this stuff down on Washington and Arlington. And, uh, and, um, you know, he went in and got this crack and he said, you know what, D to hell with my boyfriend, let's go do this. And I said, okay. And then he started thinking about, it. I said, no, that's a bad idea. I need to go. My boyfriend's going to kill me. So I took him home. I said, okay. And then the, the, my very next fair was a woman who had me take her to the same crack house. I was working in Hollywood and I went down to the same crack house uh, and she said, you know what, to hell with my boyfriend, let's do this. And so we did, I parked the cab, we, we smoked the crack. And then I said, we need some more. And we went back to the house and got some more and smoked the crack. And then I took the cab back to the, the shop and got my own car. We went back and got more crack and then went to the house. And it was six o'clock in the morning I'm in my bathrobe. The birds are chirping outside. She's on the floor of this 
with this shitty brown carpet looking for all the crack we dropped, which is none. Um, but she's picking through all the lint. And I looked in the mirror and this voice said, man, I can't let you go anywhere by yourself, can I? And I don't know who was talking, but that was my moment. It was like this, something's, something's off here. Something is, something is bad. And, and that was the, I never thought that I could do anything without, you know, having uh, that kind of a crutch, that kind of a relief at the end of it or, uh, you know, cause I would, I would keep myself clean until I did a job. And then I would, then I would give myself permission to fall apart or fall into the loving arms of drugs and alcohol. Um, and that was the beginning of that changing. A couple of things about that story is, you know, when we talk about the law of attraction and things like that, it's like, if you're, if you're bringing your sort of frequency down to that crack level, it's, it's kind of interesting how you attract it two fairs in a row, right? Both <laughs> like you, we could make the argument, the spiritual argument that you drew that into your life. And that, and that's one of the reasons why it's hard to get out of that state is because you, you keep attracting circumstances and situations that are perpetuating that state. And, and that's also, I guess, the power of a practice like meditation, which you start attracting different quality of experiences. Sure. And, and another way of looking at that is that spirit offers us continually the opportunity to choose uh, life. Mm -hmm. And it keeps giving us more and deeper reasons to choose life over what's happening. And it offers us the opportunity, you know, like, oh, so th here, th we're going to take you, uh, uh, you know, you need to, you, you want, you want darkness. Okay, here's some more darkness, but darkness in service of choosing the light. Right. You know, that's, so that's a, a slightly different way of looking at it. But yeah, absolutely. If, because what I had felt, what I felt somewhere in there was that there was this little flicker of a flame inside me that was about to get blown out. And mm -hmm. I knew if it went out that I'd be lost. Mm -hmm. So I think some people end up with that light just completely obscured and they're not able to, to get it back or they, uh, they find themselves uh, not even... Uh, able to ignore that it was ever there mm -hmm. so you hear the voice the voice says i can't leave you anywhere you can't go anywhere by yourself what do you what's the next step what do you do how do you get help i i ended up uh i i i shot on this movie for two weeks and then it was christmas break and then i I got on a train and and uh it was going to go check into a hotel and and dry out and uh, I don't know why I got on a train. It was just very dramatic. Um, and I, the train stopped in Del Mar and I saw a hotel. This is on, you know, the day before New Year's Eve. Um, and uh, I checked into this hotel and sweated and shook for three days and then got on the train and came back to L.A. I figured, OK, that's good. <laughs> and, You're all sorted. And then, <laughs> I'm all sorted. I got this, except I didn't. I was just like, I, I want. I want something. I, I need something. I, it's because you're raw, man. It's mm -hmm. like your skin is pulled off and the wind is blowing and it's just everything hurts, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I, then I found some people that helped me, you know, I just stumbled into some people who were able to help me and able to show me a different way of, of doing all this. Right. Yeah. I don't want to turn this into like an AA meeting or anything, but if someone's listening to this and they're they're having a similar experience where they recognize, hey, look, this is not sustainable. I'm thinking about going to a hotel for three days and, you know, getting myself clean. Is that is that even a little bit realistic or is that just complete? Is that still part of the delusion? It is part of the delusion. You know, it's it, they have recovery houses today. There are, you know, it's a big mm -hmm. business. You can, you know, your insurance probably covers it. And if it doesn't, you know, there are 12 step groups everywhere you look. And there are people who whose 
well-being depends upon their uh, ability to and their willingness to help. Mm -hmm. You know, all it takes is is asking for help. Say so you don't know That's, anybody who's I, in a twelve step. What do you do? Like, how do you you go online or what do you do? I think you can you go online and just you know look up you know uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. I imagine, you know, it's uh, there. Are, there are so many that you 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 know google you can get sober by going to google just google you know sobriety google help google you know uh alcoholism or drug addiction and you know mm -hmm. there are so many there are people wanting to help there are government organizations wanting to help there are people wanting to help there are hospitals you know wanting to help and if you, you know, that six degrees of separation, everyone's probably two degrees separated from someone who really has the information. So you just put the question into the universe. Now, if that question arises for you, like, God, maybe I should do something about this. Just, you know, tell your best friend, I, I think I should do something about this. Then, you know, and then they're going to tell somebody else and then they're going to say, oh, here, you should talk to this person. You know, tell your bartender, he's probably so over. I know a lot of sober bartenders, you know, they'll say, oh, you want to stop here as they're pouring you a drink, you know, just, ah, here's my number. Give me a call. So in your book, um, Embracing Bliss, which I want to talk about more later, but you referenced an, an experience. You said it was in the 80s. You went to see some Thai monk and he was going around the room blessing everyone and telling everyone these beautiful spiritual things. <laughs> Can you, would you mind sharing that story? Cause I don't know if it happened around this time, but it, I just, I just, I love that story. So I was, it was, I was, I was an actor. I, I was going to acting class and I was starting mm -hmm. to come alive. And I, you know, the truth is that I had so many things that I could name as wrong with me i needed to find some central answer um because i couldn't find an answer to everything every problem i had and so the idea of a spiritual solution came to me and i heard about it was a six week or i think a six week course on on meditation and <clears throat> it was this little thai monk a buddhist monk and he was teaching us uh, some form of mindfulness and uh <laughs> and about four weeks in, he went around the room and spoke to everyone. And virtually every single person he talked to, he would ask them a certain question. I can't remember what any of these questions were, but they would either burst into tears or start laughing in that big release sort of way. And I thought, oh, this is great. This is every, everyone gets this. And this is, uh, and he's coming to me. And so I, there was just like, I guess there were, I don't know, probably 20, 25 of us in the, in the class. And, and there was just me and two other people left. And, and he came to me and he, he stands in front of me with his, he's in his robe and he's got his hands lit in front of him. He says, he looked at me and he sort of cocked his head and said, why are you here? And I said, well, well, to, to learn, to learn how to meditate. And he sort of, smiled and shook his head and said why are you here uh it's like it's like one of those miser techniques you keep saying the same thing over and over thing. with different tones Doing a repetition exercise and and then after i said uh uh to to meditate and he just then he got really stern and says why are you here and you tell me man <laughs> i don't know <laughs> And then he just dropped his head and shook his head in a disappointed fashion and moved on. And I was the one who didn't get to have a, a release. And and scene. You know, and I and scene. Like and just and you know, it felt like, you know, like it, it was humiliation. Cause it was like I, I was not alone in that room. And uh, you know. <laughs> You know, it's like when you, you think that everyone had a meeting and decided to, uh, that, that you're not worthy of being in the group mm -hmm. and you have that feeling and then you find out they actually did have a meeting. 
Um, it was like that. Everyone just went, oh God, I'm glad that's not me. And sort of turned away from me, which is, it was, again, it was the same experience of being in that small hometown. You know, there's just something wrong with me. I don't fit, I don't belong. What are we doing here? How would you respond to him today, knowing all that you know, being a meditation teacher, et cetera, et cetera? If, if that were to happen to you today, same such a situation. I'm sure you played that scenario out. Well, it, it would be something like, um, it, it would be, it, it's, it feels like the answer would be beyond words. Because I, 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 I feel like today, he, we would just smile at each other. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be, you know, because my- I'm here for the same reason you're here. <laughs> Yeah, my whole here's my whole theory of life is that we're here to have the experience of being human and then learn to know ourselves as spirit, even as we're being human. And because of the non reality of time, uh, or the non linearity of time, we're already having the experience of being fully enlightened whether we know it or not and so someone who's uh you know because there's the, the beginning of our life and the end of our journey are all here at this same moment too and someone like that is just looking at you and seeing the end of your journey and saying do you know that do you know that's the end of your journey and you're going like oh i, I don't know and you know so i would say yeah i know that's the end of my journey too today i say yeah thank you and uh, i i'm i'm here to find out what the next steps are that you've already taken that's the, that's the quest that's what i would say to him like we're all we're all headed for to the same place and we're all starting from different places and and you know that was just one of those experiences where Oh, we're getting, I'm, I'm, I'm going off into the weeds of philosophy here, um, where, you know, I, I think we, I think we all have an assignment when we come in here, and uh, that assignment involves the challenges that we give ourselves, or the challenges that the universe gives us. And walking through those challenges is, is our job. Walk through those challenges, learn the skills that we get from walking through those challenges. And those challenges are always about seeing ourselves more as worthy and as spirit rather than as unworthy and uh small self small ego you know and that had you, ever, that, had, had you oh go ahead no go ahead no go ahead finish your thought at, at that moment i was just i was lost in the ugliness of ego and the limitations of ego without having the grounding that meditation gives us the grounding mm -hmm. in spirit where you can have all those limitations but no it's not you well it's kind of like you know an exercise instructor saying why are you here you're over you're out of shape you're overweight clearly you need to be here to exercise to get in shape um <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's why i'm here well were you clean at the time? Were you sober at no, the time? No, no, no. Okay. That no. could have been it too. He could have looked in your eyes and saw you were high on something. It's like, why I, are you here? I, I wasn't high. I was in between highs. Was, <laughs> I knew how to separate my my uh, uh, spiritual uh, longing from my getting high. I would just, I would, I would, I would time my high. Right. So that. I probably got high on the way home <laughs> from that class. Well, probably, probably made you want to get high. <laughs> I need yeah, to probably escape. that did definitely. So let's talk about um, <clears throat> you and I are teach the same style of meditation, Vedic meditation, and um, we both have the same teacher, uh, Tom Knowles. You had a very different introduction to Tom Knowles than me and you've actually written about that which is another story that didn't make the book but that's fine 
Um, can you share, because I think that would give context to where you're coming from, because you'd already been to India, you'd already studied with people. Can you share uh, what your introduction was to Vedic meditation as it related to everything else you've been doing prior to that? Uh, my wife uh, and I have a friend, Renee Stahl, who had learned meditation from Tom mm -hmm. Knowles. And she told Adele, that uh, my wife, that, um, you know, you go to this guy, you get a word, you repeat it, and it makes you happy. And so Adele said, I, I want to go get a word. And, and I just said, you know, let me know how that works out for you. Because I was at this point, there was, I had, I had decided that literally six weeks before this happened, I had this conversation with myself, I said, you know what, if I was 48, I said, if it wasn't, if it hasn't changed by now, it's not going to change. Whatever you are now, you're stuck with this. So deal with it. And I thought, I literally had the thought, I, I guess I've got about 70% of my life back. You know, so 70% is going to have to be good enough. And, and so I quit trying. I just quit trying to change. I quit trying to fix myself is the way it occurred to me at the time. And, you know, and, and Adele said, no, come on, we're going to go listen to this guy talk. And <laughs> we went to Will Dalton's place on Laurel uh, and Laurel Avenue in West Hollywood and this lovely courtyard apartment. And we went in and uh, Will greeted us and uh, we sat down in this room with, you know, 20, 25 other people. And I looked around at the people and I just thought, these are not my people. And I looked, there was a picture of, you know, this orange robe teacher. I didn't like that. I didn't trust orange robes at this point. And, and, you know, and I just said, you know what, I, I, I can't, before Tom even came out to talk, I, I just said, I, I can't hang here and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for you outside. She said, no, I'll go with you. And so we got up and left and <laughs> Will was outside still greeting people. And he went, what are you, wait. And, you know, we just walked past him and left. Um, thanks for your, thanks for your hospitality, sir. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and Renee called us and said, so you're going to learn? And, and Adele said, no, Jeff made us leave. And so uh, she said, well, he's coming back next month. And she said, okay, I'll go. And so the next month we went to another talk by this Tom Knowles guy. And we went with a couple of friends of ours, uh, one of whom uh, was a, a, a gentleman from Sri Lanka who was a, 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 a very staunch Catholic at the time. Um, and he heckled Tom <laughs> in the meeting, in the, in the uh, intro talk. And, you know, at the, it was the only time I ever saw Tom do this. He, he I remember Bernie saying, Oops, Bernie. Uh, Bernie saying, "What about faith?" And and Tom said, "Well, you, the thing about this practice is you don't need faith." And and Bernie said, "Oh, that's too bad." And and Tom said, "Well, I think you've heard quite enough uh, from me. And if you have any more questions, you can ask Will." And he got up and left. <laughs> he went into the back of the the apartment. And then I wasn't going to learn again. And and Renee said why and i said because i don't why should i trust this guy mm -hmm. and he's he wants money you know and how do i know it's going to work and she said here call this number and she just gave me a number i didn't know who it was and it was tom and and uh i said you know renee gave me this number and and uh, he said why and i said because i i listened to your talk and i don't want to learn and he said <laughs> why don't you want to learn? I said, well, because I, why should I trust you? And, and because I, I, I didn't think you were supposed to have to pay for spiritual teachings. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you're not paying for the teaching. The teaching itself is priceless. You're paying for my time. If I didn't charge for this, I'd have to open an auto parts store in Flagstaff. Um, and uh, not that he would ever open an auto parts <laughs> store. Um <laughs> And I said, but, and, and then, uh, well, okay, then he said, what else? I said, well, because I, why should I trust you? He said, you, you can't trust me. You don't know me. But how did you feel when I was speaking? Did you trust? Did it feel right? Did it resonate? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yeah. He said, so what time do you want to come in tomorrow? And, and so I was just like, okay, I'll go. 
you know, and I went and learned and uh, immediately I knew it was the thing for me. I knew that it was what I'd been looking for. It was the first time ever that I had freedom from my self, freedom from the, you know, the, the, the carnival inside. Did Adele have the same experience? She had a good experience. She had a, you know, she transcended. She went somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we were both in at that point. Mm -hmm. I think I had a more pronounced experience because of where I started from. Because mm -hmm. I was, you know, hell really is a, 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 a self-induced phenomenon it, or a, an interior phenomenon. It just has... You know, in the Veda, uh, we, we know that heaven is a body dependent phenomenon. You know, hell too is a body dependent phenomenon. You have to have the sense of uh, the need to be tortured or have the mm -hmm. paradigm that uh, insists you be tortured or that you mm -hmm. torture yourself, however you, you want to put that. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.